My name is Alexis McGivern and I'm here at COP28 in Dubai uh, to have a discussion on the role of fossil fuels in the transition to net zero. We're very grateful to the Royal Society for facilitating this space for us. I have with me Dr. Kevin Hepburn, who is the Bangkok Professor of Environmental Economics and who will shortly be giving a talk uh, for the Royal Society about uh, joining up the economic modeling and climate science um, for net zero. Uh, we also have Dr. Miles Allen, who is a Professor of Geosystem Science, the Director of the Oxford Net Zero Initiative and also a fellow of the Royal Society. So we're here for a frank and honest conversation about the role of fossil fuels in the transition to net zero. We've had a lot of discussion around the role of fossil fuels in the transition to net zero in the last few days and we've had many calls from scientists, uh, the WHO, from climate justice campaigners that uh, fossil fuels must be equitably phased out in order to meet the goals of the Paris Agreement. But I want to start us off with a discussion about um, the role and the key indisputable facts about the role of fossil fuels in reaching net zero. So I'll start with you, Miles. Eventually, we need to stop, we will stop using fossil fuels. The other thing I think we also need to all agree on is that because we've dithered about reducing the rate at which we produce carbon dioxide from burning fossil fuels, it's gone up steadily ever since we discovered the cumulative impact of fossil fuels almost 15 years ago. Um, we will generate more carbon dioxide from burning fossil fuels than we can afford to dump in the atmosphere and still meet the goals of the Paris Climate Agreement. So at the same time that we phase down the rate at which we produce fossil carbon dioxide from fossil sources, we have to phase up permanent, safe geological disposal. I think everybody's pretty much agreed on that. I'll hear from you, Kevin. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's hard to disagree with it. I think it's fundamentally true that we need to phase down and ultimately out fossil fuels as fast as possible. And obviously, if we've got residual emissions in 2050, we simply have to clear up the mess, and that involves an increase in removals. Now, I think um, there's a couple of other facts that we can inject into the discussion. One is that uh, we know from the past history, at least to date, that CCS and carbon removal methods have not shown very rapid rates of learning. Now that doesn't necessarily mean they won't show rapid rates of learning in the future, but it does mean we have to think quite broadly about the portfolio of methods that we have to take CO2 out of the air on the one hand and to capture it at source on the other, because the recent work by Oxford suggests that both the capture the transportation and the storage of carbon at the moment is not showing the same kind of rapid rates of progress that we're seeing in renewable energy technologies. But fundamentally, we do want and need and want to encourage those rates of progress. And Oxford, with other universities, Miles and I are working together to lead this process of uh, trialing different ways of removing CO2 from the atmosphere and increasing that rate of learning. So I think that's, there's a set of important facts there about costs. And of course, if, if we don't learn fast enough, then the cheapest thing to do will be to get rid of fossil fuels absolutely as fast as possible. We need to do that anyway, and I don't think anybody disagrees with that either. So this is a kind of both reduce the amount of mess you're making as fast as possible and start getting ready to clean up the mess that you have already made. So a piece that's incredibly important to address is that the uh, damages of fossil fuels are not limited to dumping carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And I want to come back to something you said earlier, Miles, about the fossil fuel emissions being something that we need to handle. And we have this discussion very frequently about abating fossil fuel emissions. But there are many more externalities to fossil fuels than just carbon in the atmosphere, including, for example, health implications, uh, indigenous land rights violations, biodiversity loss, and these all cannot be magically overcome by scaling up CCS or other carbon dioxide removal. So I want you to address that head on because that is a big concern. No, 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 I mean, that is absolutely right. I mean, all activities we do, um, but particularly extractive activities like the extraction of fossil fuels, have all kinds of externalities that need to be addressed. They need to be mitigated as far as they can be, and then people need to be compensated, justly compensated, for whatever cannot be mitigated. And uh, that, that, that goes without saying. And it goes, um, and, and the fossil fuel industry hasn't made it easy for us because there's been plenty of cases where they, they've 
definitely behaved badly uh, in the past. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm coming at this from a climate physics perspective. I can tell you what it takes to stop a fossil fuel from causing global warming, but that's not the same as saying what it takes to stop a fossil fuel from causing harm. Yeah, and I just want to acknowledge that fossil fuel companies have been causing damage in the past and very much in the present as well, so can't let them off the hook too much. And I might add, Alexis, that the scale of those other externalities, negative externalities to health and to local environments and to biodiversity to people, are exceptionally large, and perhaps even larger than the scale of the climate externality in many instances. And one thing I often get challenged by when I'm out and about is but what about the mining of metals and minerals for the clean technology industries of the future? Don't they cause harm? And the answer is they do. Uh, they cause quite a lot of harm as well. They need to be priced and we need responsible mining and we need mining firms who are going to be protecting their local environments. It's always worth, I think, comparing apples and apples. And it's not enough to say, you know, local effects of mining for the clean energy transition are negative, therefore we shouldn't do it. Because we need to get our energy from somewhere. So the question is which one's worse? Now, I'm not sure that the jury is entirely out on this, but it seems to me that the, the, the scale of the negative externalities from the mining industry required to deliver clean energy is about 10%, an order of magnitude lower, that is, than the damage done by the fossil fuel industry, but we'll have to look at further research to be clear about it. And if I could just chip on on this, if you do dispose of the carbon dioxide generated by any continued use of fossil fuels, that's another set of externalities in the disposal of carbon dioxide, which would also have to be taken into account. So that's another reason, of course, to minimize our use, because the, the the fossil fuel that causes least harm is the one you just leave alone in the first place. I just want to come back quickly on that, Miles, and you talk about cleaning up the mess, and that brings us to the issue of abatement and the, the word unabated, um, because those qualifiers, including what you said earlier, dealing with the fossil fuel emissions and, and putting that you know qualifier of emissions rather than just fossil fuels, and also unabated, which is a highly contested word. Um, the fear from civil society is that the threshold for abatement has not clearly been defined, and so you could abate a project 50% and include that as part of an abated fossil fuel. So I want to hear your thoughts on that. Well, well there I'd absolutely agree with anybody in civil society who's very suspicious of the word unabated, not clearly defined. I'm not sure unabated is a very useful word at all. It's, it's, it's a negative word. It's a sort of double negative almost. You're, un, not, you're not abating something. So, you know, what, what is very clear is what fully abated use of fossil fuels has to mean if it's going to be consistent with the goals of the Paris Agreement, which means one tonne of CO2 safely and permanently disposed of back into the geosphere for every tonne generated from any continued use of fossil fuels. Lots of people are talking about much more complicated definitions of abatement. I think we, we allow this to get complicated at our peril, because fundamentally the physical requirement is extremely simple. You've got to get rid of all of the CO2, not 90% of it, you know, and, and if you can't capture it all at source, you've got to recover it from the atmosphere. And crucially, of course, doing that will cost a lot of money. And it means that an awful lot of the uses of fossil fuels we make at the moment will no longer make sense. If you have to get rid of the CO2, it won't make sense to use fossil fuels on the scale we use them at the moment. And I'd love to build on that because I think this is also another major area of agreement. Miles is absolutely right to impose these costs upon the fossil fuel industry. That's the right answer. It's very clear. They're the ones making the pollution. They're the ones that should clean up the mess. And currently, the costs of cleanup are incredibly high. So at the point where those costs are imposed upon the fossil fuel industry, that would rapidly accelerate the transition to alternatives. So if Mars had his way, I think what would happen is not the long-term continuation of fossil fuel use, but a rapid acceleration towards cleaner substitutes, which we should all be welcoming. Yeah, so just to, to clarify and emphasize a point that we've discussed before, Miles, uh, and what you just said, if you were fully abating fossil fuels, that inevitably leads to a phase down and or out of all fossil fuel use because it would not be competitive, especially with the research that comes from Oxford that shows just how competitive renewables are. I, I just wanted to very, very transparently address 
the point that talking about abatement gives a loophole for the fossil fuel industry to continue and persist. And a lot of fear, especially from climate justice campaigners, that the fossil fuel industry has disrupted negotiations on climate for more than 30 years, and they're looking for any way out, and that abatement, this magic word, has given them this way out. I just want you to talk about that more specifically. I mean, yes, clearly there's plenty of well-justified mistrust um, in, in this discussion at the moment. I, I think the best we can do as the academic community is establish the facts that people have to work with um, and make and, and point out things that may be obvious to us but may not be obvious to everybody um, and point out, for example, that government paying for abatement while private companies make the money to selling the product that requires abating, you know, that's sending the wrong signals to the market. It's effectively subsidizing what, what they're selling. Um, and as we all know, subsidies lead to wasteful use. So, um, you know, it, it's, it's absolutely clear that we need to establish the fact base that we have to work around and we have to therefore be clear to people that what full abatement of fossil fuels needs to mean and the fact that that will inevitably eventually result in the, uh, us no longer using them and everybody agrees as i said right at the outset everybody agrees that we won't be using fossil fuels forever but the crucial point is we don't have time left to stop climate change only by eliminating fossil fuel use we have to also at the same time scale up our ability to get rid of the carbon dioxide they generate. That's the crucial point. We have to do both at the same time. And the costs of doing it have to be ideally imposed on those who are benefiting from our continued use of fossil fuels, and perhaps those who benefited from our historical use of fossil fuels as well. Although then, then we start getting into political questions which go beyond the science. So that, that is absolutely right. It's a both and story. The other thing that's important here, so Alexis, you're asking about the risks of moral hazard, is the technical term. The idea that because we've got a way of dealing with the waste of fossil fuel that we slow down our efforts, that simply is not justified by the science. We can't afford to slow down the rate of reduction of emissions, the rate at which we phase out fossil fuels. It has to go as absolutely as fast as possible. And we need to do this mess cleaning up exercise as well. It's hard, I think, sometimes for people to hold both of those thoughts in their heads at the same time. But both points, uh, both of them is true. And I think it's the it's the, the confusion in there is that people feel like you have to pick a side. Either you're for renewable energy or you're for um, fossil fuels without the emissions. No, you've got to be for both of them. Now, there are choices around the margin, uh, but in a sense, they're not huge choices because we're not going fast enough on fossil fuel uh, CCS or carbon dioxide removal, nowhere near fast enough. And we're not going fast enough on the deployment of clean energy either. So we have to go double, triple, quadruple the speed on both. Thanks so much both. And I just want to, um, I know we're running short on time, but I just want to get one, one more question in, which is there's recent research that came out of the Smith School that shows that there are legal implications for countries over-relying on CDR, carbon dioxide removal, um, and that those delaying action in the hopes that there will be future technologies that will allow them to, to remove their emissions from the atmosphere causes issues with international law. And I just want to hear that delay. No, I, I think that's absolutely right. And this is why we need to absolutely squash the suggestion that you know pollute now and clean up later because we don't even know we don't even know how much the cleanup's going to cost um, or, or what the you know and so so that idea that we can that this allows us just to punt it down the road is is clearly not supported by any of the evidence which is also why getting on with it will discover what this actually costs and I think Cameron may well be right it's going to be very expensive and therefore it's going to provide one of the strongest possible incentives to actually scale down our use of fossil fuels as fast as possible. 
Now, to be clear, I hope it's going to be really cheap, but it probably, it looks very expensive. I mean, I hope all of these solutions are going to be really cheap because I'm a boring economist and I like things to be cheap. But, you know, all the evidence is suggesting that the cheapest way of dealing with this at the moment is going hard on uh, clean energy, basically, and clean, clean tech. But, but on that, I think we should lay down a challenge to the fossil fuel industry. If they say they can do this, and they say it'll keep their product affordable and desirable, and people still want to buy their product with all the with all the carbon dioxide verifiably disposed of, and allowing government inspectors to make sure that it really is disposed of and it's not, you know, just leaking out somewhere down the road. Um, if if the, you know, they need to be put on the spot and said, okay, prove it. They say they can do it. Where's the evidence? And then Alexis, to your point, is not just the cost of the CO2 disposal. We need to add in all of the other negative costs of these different methods, both in the clean technology space and in the fossil space, so that you've got a proper side-by-side -side comparison. Now, I have, a, I have a view that that's going to show clean energy, clean technology being vastly cheaper. But that might not be. But we need to do it, and then we need to let, effectively, the private sector compete on that levelized basis. In the moment, the fossil, fuels, fossil fuel industry is getting a massive leg up from our system, from our governments, from our economic and financial systems, because they're not paying anywhere near the full costs of the damage they're doing. So I think one thing that is worth addressing is that um, discussions about science and academia can often have um, impacts that lead to political agendas of the folks that we don't necessarily agree or want to be um, supported or profiled. Um, and there are questions, Miles, around whether or not you are funded by the fossil fuel industry for these takes, and I just want to let you address that directly. Um, first of all, no, no of course, um, the University of Oxford has very clear policy on receiving money from the fossil fuel in, uh, industry, so we, we as Oxford Net Zero, I'm, I personally am not obviously receiving money from the fossil fuel industry. I do believe in engaging with them. I, I'm very happy to talk to anybody who works in the fossil fuel industry because I think that they have to play a very important part in the solution. Um, so on, on that, yes, I talk to them a lot. Um, but, you know, fundamentally, I'm here as an academic to represent the facts. Thanks. And Cameron, would you like to... Well, Same certainly, question. I think Miles said it all beautifully. I mean, from my my perspective, I think engaging with everybody is important. So, on the one hand, I'm on the board of a fund that is designed to effectively um, make money by accelerating the transition, and if that means very loudly divesting and damaging the reputation of fossil fuel interests, then great. And on the other hand, I'm on Royal Dutch Shell's advisory board. And I find that to be an incredibly interesting and useful for me process to see how capital allocation decisions are being made. Well, I'm not on the board. I don't make the decisions. But I, but I get to feed in the sort of insights about how renewable energy is going to be beating fossil fuel technologies that then hopefully helps a company like Shell uh, think differently about its future. Great, thanks so much. And for my part, I am not funded by the fossil fuel industry. I think it's important to engage with them, but I also think it's important to provide resources and support to um, folks who are incredibly underfunded, who uh, you know uh, don't have the same opportunities and access to knowledge and information. So I think it's equally important to engage on the other side. Well. And at Oxford Net Zero, we are absolutely delighted to speak to anybody else as well. In fact, it's often easier to talk. <laughs> to those who are not involved in the fossil fuel industry, but it's not our job to only have the easy conversations. Thank you both. Great, so I want to thank you both <clears throat> for your time and to the Royal Society for giving us this space. I just want to emphasize and closing the areas of agreement, which is that there is no long-term future of fossil fuels, that they will be phased down and out, starting with the unabated fossil fuels, and that we need to have a very clear definition of what abatement means and what fully abated fossil fuels looks like, but also recognizing that fully abated fossil fuels does not mean fossil fuels without problems, because there are many other negative externalities. Um, that we need to hold in our minds the importance of scaling up cheap um, renewable technologies while recognizing their externalities, while also being ready for the inevitable um, technologies that will be needed because of our delays. So very many common areas of agreement, and I think the one thing we all agree on is that the fossil fuel industry should not be let off the hook, that we should keep applying the pressure and making sure that we use our collective resources both within academia, within the climate justice movement, um, to all push for, for a strong outcome here at COP28. Beautifully summarized, Alexis. Thank you, yes, all the things we agree on. <laughs> Thanks so much.